This week's episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by GoDaddy, Netflix, and the HP Media Smart Server, powered by Microsoft Windows Home Server. Hey guys, welcome back to the kitchen. Um, I'm going to follow up on our brute forcing segment from last time we were here, except I'm feeling a little under the weather, so I'm going to bypass the whole um, hash salting with margaritas until I'm feeling a little bit better. So in the meantime, last time we did offline brute forcing. Today we're going to talk about online brute forcing with some chicken noodle soup. We've got some homemade goodness. But before we get into the ingredients, Let's get into some theory. See, the biggest difference between online brute force and offline, obviously, is you're connected to something, right? You're, you're hitting something that's live. You're, and in most cases, there theoretically is somebody on the other end, right? And, um, and it's obviously much slower. I mean, we showed off GPUs where you can get like, you know, thousands and thousands of attempts per second. And we're going to really be um, calculating our attempts in minutes. Um, now, I, I, before I get too much further, I must stress that I am taking the angle here of, um, of countermeasures. So while I am showing some online brute forcing um, uh, a demonstration, really what I, I want to highlight here are some of the ways that you can use this to protect yourself. And this is really just, it's, an, it's a good example for many other types of services that are susceptible to very similar things. So the practice is kind of similar. Um, so the cool thing is online brute force attacks, you know, if you're the, the, you're the sys administrator on the other end, whatnot, can be detected. Uh, it's just a matter of, are you looking? Are you looking for the right thing? And if you are, and if you know what you can do, there's lots of things that we can do to actually reduce the effectiveness of a brute force attack. So um, in our demonstration, we're going to be using terminal services, a wonderful um, service in most Windows servers, hell, it's even in Windows XP if you've got it enabled. It's a, a beautiful little thing that lets us do remote access uh, using remote desktop connection, RDP, uh, get our, our remote connection on. And it's nice because it's pretty ubiquitous across the board on Windows operating systems and makes systems administrators' lives like actually usable. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get into the ingredients. Now for the hack, our ingredients are really nothing more than Nmap to find our target and a program called TS Grinder, which is an online brute force attack program for, uh, for Microsoft terminal services for remote desktop connection. Okay? Um, as far as the chicken noodle soup is concerned, you know, forget that stuff in a can. I'm feeling really sick. I want to make some homemade stuff and feel good, right? So we've got a pound of uh, boneless, skinless chicken breast, right? Uh, we've got four of these cubes, uh, this is new to me, four of these cubes, bouillon cubes, correct me if I'm wrong in that pronunciation, but that should be cool. Eight cups of water already in there. We got, uh, we got we're going to do two cups of egg noodles thin. It's going to be yummy. Uh, we've got uh, a can of chicken, uh, chicken broth and a ch can of cream of chicken, just to make it a little creamier, right? And then we've got some uh, chopped carrots, some diced celery, some diced mushrooms. We're going to throw some onions into the boil and a little bit of garlic in a hack five shot glass. That's what we're going to do. So um, basically, we're going to put it all together except for the uh, noodles. And we're going to let that boil, or not quite boil, like right under boiling, for like a half hour. Once the chicken's cooked, it's going to like soak in all that goodness. Then we're going to uh, take the chicken out. We're going to chop it up. And then we're going to pop it back in with the noodles until they're really yummy. And then we're going to serve it. And hopefully, I will start feeling better. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, here you go. You want to throw this in there? You don't, you don't like the chicken? You familiar with that brand? All right, that's what I thought. Let's not forget our onions. 
All right, so while Snubs is helping me out here, let me paint you guys the scenario. It's Joe, our sysadmin, and Joe, our sysadmin, he just set up a, a new Windows server. And his boss, like many bosses before him, want him to be available off hours in case of any kind of emergency. We're not going to get into the whole overtime pay thing. Now, to make his life a little easier, Joe decided to open some ports in the office firewall to give him access to the remote desktop feature while he's at home. Well, Joe is confident about his Windows Box's security. You see, he's got automatic updates turned on, and he's picked a pretty good password. It's ridiculous. No, I mean, it's R exclamation point, D exclamation point, C U one zero U five. Ridiculous. Well, then out of nowhere, Pineapple and Evil servers show up, and they fire up Nmap, and they look around for anything on port 3389, and then they see Joe's server, and then they fire up TS Grinder, an online terminal service brute forcing tool, and then they use the dash delete option with a really big dictionary file, and they point it at Joe's server, and then Pineapple has a whiskey sour, and then he passes out, and Evil Server does all the dirty work, and since the brute force attack takes place over an encrypted RDP connection, any would-be intrusion detection systems don't notice. And since TS Grinder disconnects after five failed attempts, nothing is written to the event log. So Joe doesn't even know. Well, eventually Evil Server gets in and Pineapple maliciously defaces his Windows wallpaper with a rude comment about Joe's mom. Now, without getting too detailed into an already pretty simple hack, let's just take that for what it is and start talking about countermeasures. Now keep in mind, I'm using Windows Terminal Services here as an example, and this, could, it, this theory really applies to just about anything uh, online that you can brute force. So um, as far as the Windows Server is concerned, there's a couple of little techniques that we can use here to reduce the effectiveness and the likelihood of this uh, attack taking place. Now on our Windows uh, Server, the first thing that we're going to want to do is come in here and re uh, rename the administrator account. Um, the administrator account, by default, has access to, uh, re to terminal services, to uh, you know, remote desktop. And uh, we're going to want to change that to something else. So I actually have a script here. It's a pretty simple Visual Basic script that we can just go ahead and uh, call from the command prompt with C script. And what it's going to do is rename the local administrator account from uh, administrator to Tina Fey is hot, because most hackers don't try to use that as the username that they log in from. Uh, we, I have links in the show notes to do the same exact thing with a domain administrator account. Uh, I just don't have a domain server set up right here that I can uh, walk you through it. But get links for that. Uh, the next thing that we want to do is we want to review our password best practices. And I've got some links in the show notes to that. And I also want to bring up this great website called passwordmeter.com. I know we talked about it in episode three, season three, episode nine. And it's a great site that's going to help you um, test the strength of your password. So again, you're going to want more than 14 characters just for the whole you know, LM hash dealy. But uh, you also want something with lots of numbers and letters and characters and whatnot. So next thing we need to do is enable complex passwords. We can do that here with a little tool called PassProp. OK, so we're going to run PassProp and see what it gives us. Now we've got. The, if you just run pass props without the uh, slash question mark, it's going to let you know, let's see, uh, passwords can be simple. The administrator account may not be locked out. That's what we want to change. Uh, so we're going to do pass prop with slash complex. And that's going to force complex passwords. And then we're going to go back and do it with slash admin lockout. What that means is, by default, Windows Server l does not lock out the administrator account if it has too many failed attempts. It does this for most other users, and this is set up in your policies, but the administrator account is kind of like a wild card here, right? Well, setting this allows the administrator account to be locked out if too many failed attempts are done remotely. It does not do anything for at the actual keyboard. Physical security is a totally another topic that we could talk about. There's fun things you can do with USB uh, brute forcing that, uh, that emulates a keyboard. I'm not going to get into that now. But you're not going to need to worry if you enable this uh, and you, you beef up your password a couple of times. You're still going to have all the attempts you want physically at the keyboard. OK, so then what we want to do, and, and this is something that I do, but you don't have to. This is really a security through obscurity thing, just like changing 
it to uh, from administrator to Tina Fey is hot is security through obscurity. We want to go here into the H key uh, local machine and under uh, system current control set control and then terminal server you'll find the Windows uh, I'm sorry the Win stations and RDP TCP folders and in there there is a um, there is a D word here called port number and that port number by default is um, is the is 3389 and that's exactly what evil server and pineapple did was they just end mapped for that port and they found this server this is not foolproof there is a program called um, probe TS that uh, will basically probe a, um, a Windows server to see if it has terminal services running you can do the same thing with that map really but um, but it, it is going to help you a little bit to just obscurify that a bit. The next thing is to enable uh, extensive auditing. I have links to that in the show notes since this is a uh, domain, not a domain controller. It's a little bit more difficult to demonstrate it for you guys. But basically, what we want to do is uh, tell it to give us um, give us some information in the event log on failed access attempts. Right. So no, thank you. Um, that's really. Really? What? All right, e eat it at your own risk. No, but thank you. It would denial of service, come on. <laughs> so um, that's another, th another thing. No, that's, a, that's a topic for another night. Anyway, um, so the, the enabling ex extensive auditing is basically going to allow us to uh, see um, failed logon attempts in our event viewer. Uh, there are a couple of programs that I recommend that I will have links to the show notes for so that you can actually see like, you know, when, when these things have been happening and even alert you like, hey, you know, you're getting, you know, thousands of attempts on your, your, your FTP, your terminal service, whatever. Because if you see here, I go ahead and I try like more than five times. And on the sixth time here to try to log into re, uh, through remote access the, through the remote desktop, what's going to happen is uh, in my event viewer under system, I'm going to see... Uh, an event ID uh, t uh, 1012, and that is remote session from client exceeded the maximum uh, failed login attempts, right? And was first uh, forcibly terminated. That is the only indication you get by default that somebody's trying to brute force your uh, remote desktop, your, your terminal services. That's it by default. So you want to enable the advanced logging features. And you might want to look into getting some programs that will alert you when something like that has happened. And then finally, the best thing that you could possibly do to limit your exposure to an online brute force attempt on remote access, or I'm sorry, why do I keep saying that? Remote desktop is to not leave your remote desktop uh, service open to the world. Um, we've talked about in the past how to tunnel VNC traffic over something like SSH. You can do the same thing with any protocol, any port. So if you just leave one SSH server running on your network, you can get to anything else you want. Uh, so that's a more advanced topic. I'll have some links that'll help you out in the show notes if you need to start doing that right now. And let me know if you'd like to see something about that because I can whip up a dish for SSH tunneling. All right, I hope that was informative. We're gonna check on the uh, chicken here a little later on in the show and um, and send me some love because I'm not feeling good. All right? All right, take care, guys. Okay, so this month we are playing Battlefield 2. And I got to say, the kids over at hack5land.squarespace.com voted for this and it got raving reviews. Everybody wants to play it. So, you know, if it's not your forte, maybe you should vote for something else. Anyway, we're playing on January 31st. It's bf2.hack5.org, and definitely join us in with the game. Uh, and I also have to thank our sponsor, Netflix. I gotta say, I'm definitely enjoying those uh, Battlestar Galactica DVDs. Thank you very much. With Netflix, you can rent over 90,000 titles online, including lots of Blu-ray titles, with free shipping both ways to your home. They now have a, over 40 shipping centers, so almost all deliveries happen in just one business day. And Netflix plans start at $4.99. As a new member, you can get a no-risk two-week free trial membership. Check it out at www.netflix.com slash hack5. And please, guys, don't forget the www. I think Matt's going to take it away now, and um, I'm going to go get me some of that chicken noodle soup. See ya. All right, guys, so today I'm going to show you some alternatives to Windows Terminal Services. Now, 
You guys may be asking yourself, why on earth would you need an alternative to Windows Terminal Server? Uh, well, turns out Terminal Service licensing is expensive. Uh, you're going to be paying about $85 to $90 per license for a Windows Terminal Server. And that starts to add up quite a bit after a while. Um, there are a lot of small companies and uh, small businesses that would really get a lot of usefulness out of terminal services if they could actually just implement it in a cost-effective manner. Um, some of the benefits to running terminal services before we actually get into the segment are you know, software licensing. You don't have to buy licensing for every single computer that you're going to install it on to because you're actually only installing it on a single machine. Uh, the other is hardware. You don't need a Core 2 Duo machine with you know, 4 gigs of RAM to you know, run Outlook and run you know, your accounting software that just so happens to be based on Java. Bad Java. So what we're going to do is actually use thin clients to connect to our Windows Terminal Server so that we can actually just get to the Terminal Services uh, login. Uh, and basically, you then utilize the server that you're running on as the horsepower and the brains behind you know, all your uh, running applications. And think back to if you, or if you don't work in an office, think back to the last time that you were in an office. Uh, how many people run the same bunch of applications? You've got Outlook for your email or Thunderbird. You've got your web browsing. And you've got your accounting and maybe some other research one. Okay, Five or six applications during the course of a day, a user will use 90% of the time. Um, basically, your, your you know, $1,500 Dell, HP, IBM, whatever, is going to waste when you're just using those applications and nothing else. Now, CAD. We can obviously understand you need a big beacon machine, go you. But for everybody else, all you need is a terminal services login. Now, I think uh, small business server and stuff like that, they all come with, I think, five terminal services logins. Great. What happens when you have 25 people that you want to actually use terminal server for? Well, you go out, you get the licensing, you install the licensing, and you work with you know, your licensing manager to actually make sure that blah, 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 blah. There's a much easier way, and actually you don't even need Windows 2003 server to utilize terminal services. Uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to use a Windows XP box that we have just laying around the office and actually use that as a terminal server. Now you ask, how can we do that? Well, very easy. Uh, there's an application called XP Unlimited that's available at xpunlimited.nl, not .com, .nl. Uh, and basically what we can do is we could take any Vista, uh, any XP, or even 2003 uh, machine and turn it into a terminal server, so long as it is 32-bit. He's working on the 64-bit you know, whole thing, but 32-bit for now, which is cool. Uh, the really good thing about this is it's more cost effective. Uh, the licensing model is actually going to allow you to have unlimited users for about the same cost as it would cost you to license five users uh, with the Microsoft terminal server licensing. Uh, there's two versions available. Uh, one of them is the enterprise version, which allows you to authenticate over a domain for your terminal server logins. Uh, and some other stuff, load balancing, which he's currently working on. Uh, and then there's also the classic version, which will allow you to specify 5, 10, or unlimited license numbers. Uh, and this just uses local, uh, a local built-in username and group database. So what we're going to do is I've actually already got it installed. Uh, it's actually running on this machine right here. And we're actually going to come over here to the control panel. Now, in the demo version, you're going to get three logins. Okay? Now, one of those being a local login, because we're logged in locally. So there's one active session. Uh, we can come over here and see the terminal services configuration. Change the port from 3389 if you want to feel a little bit more secure through obscurity. Okay? Um, there's your option for, do you want members to be a uh, you know, people with remote desktop access to be required to be in that you know, user group, which is probably a good idea so that you have some auditing that you can go back to that 
uh, that group and say to yourself, okay, these are the people who have remote access into uh, this terminal server. Or you could just do, if they have a domain login, you're good to go. Application. Now, if you have ever used terminal services before on Windows, application limiting and, uh, you know, uh, can get a little hairy. Uh, this is as easy as it could possibly be. You've got your list of users on the left and list of groups. What we've done is we've gone ahead and we've created a Darren user because Darren doesn't need a big machine. Darren just needs terminal services. And he's flicking me off right now, but it's true. Uh, so what we've done is we've gone ahead and we've limited Darren to Firefox and Notepad, the two things Darren needs the most and only ever needs. What we can do is we can actually you know, create as many custom applications as we want if we want to lock the user down. If not, you can just give them, you know, you can install the local admin, you know, all the applications that you want, and then it's just like another terminal server where they have access to those. So what we can do is go ahead and create a, another application if we wanted to, uh, and this time we can name it, oh god, I don't even know what's installed on the machine. We'll call it temp because it's not actually going to be there. Um, and we'll call it temp.exe. It's not even, it's not here, but that's as easy as it could possibly be. We can uh, verify and, uh-oh, the application that we just typed in isn't there. So when we've actually gone ahead and we've wanted to change the application, we hit verify first and the application will make sure that the application, XP Unlimited will make sure that what you want to put in there is actually going to be there. Guess what? It's not, so we can just go ahead and remove it. So we're going to verify, and everything is okay, and we can save the settings. Now, the other cool thing about this is, is it comes with its own built-in web server. Now, you may be asking yourself, why do I need a web server? Well, sometimes firewall blocking, you don't have the ability to change, you know, maybe somebody blocks 3389 for some reason, who the hell knows, okay? A lot of times, people don't want to open a client or don't know how to open a client, blah, 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 blah. It's just easier to tell them to go to a website. In this case, we could go to the IP address of our machine, and I'll show you on this other machine here. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to open Firefox, actually, excuse me, IE, because it needs to execute the Darren, where the hell is your IE on here? Uh, Star run type I explore. I hide it. Darren's not a big fan of Internet Explorer. So, okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to my IP address of the machine, which is the XP Unlimited machine, which is 10.10, .10, .10, if I can type correctly, dot O dot 141. That should come up, I think. Pretty sure. It's taking this taking a second. Hold on. Am I gonna am I gonna boof? Ha <laughs> ha. I did not boof. Okay. So here it's gonna ask you about the VB script, and apparently Darren's Acer has some VB script something turned off. But what you can do here is if it actually installed the ActiveX control, you can enter your username and password that you would you you hand out to your users and they could connect right from the web interface. Uh, you can also do uh, settings for the different, you know, inside the web interface. But what we're going to do is we're going to show you an example of how to, what it looks like when you actually log in via RDP. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, you know, terminal services is one of those things that if you use it at home, you're like, oh, I just use RDP. Well, that's terminal services. So what we're going to do is Darren, and I think I remember his password. And here we go. So here you can see that we're actually running the demo version of XP Unlimited. Okay? And under Darren's profile, we actually had it set up to start his Firefox as well as Notepad. But we chose to have Notepad minimized and Firefox maximized on startup. So here, we don't have any start menu. We don't have, you know, uh, all the crap on the desktop that maybe some of the other users have. What we've got is this little button up in the left-hand corner which actually lists Darren's options. 
Darren has Firefox, and Darren has Notepad. Darren can't get himself into trouble by breaking an otherwise $1,500 machine. Instead, he's isolated into this user environment on this machine here. Uh, and he can open multiple copies of Notepad if he really wanted to, or he could open multiple copies of Firefox if he really wanted to. Now, you can actually go ahead and enter, like I said, any application you really want. You can also nest menus one deep if you have you know, the Microsoft suite of applications. You don't want to block that all up. The other nice thing and the last thing that I'm going to talk about is terminal services on security on the server side. Basically, what it's going to do is it's actually going to show you, much like Windows Terminal Server, you can actually go ahead and take a peek. Don't get too crazy because you could probably screw some stuff up in here. But user configuration and local computer configuration, just like you would if you were going to do you know, Windows Terminal Services, you can lock down DNS clients, uh, you know, your security settings, run you know, startup scripts. Basically, anything that you could do security-wise with terminal services, you can do with XP Unlimited. It's completely, completely compatible. Uh, I've been using term, uh, this XP Unlimited for probably the last couple days, and it really reminded me of when I was working for a company that actually deployed terminal services correctly. Okay, So if you think that you have a need for terminal services and you don't have the money to say to your boss, boss, look, we've got 30 people. I think 20 of them you know, could get by on terminal services. Think about it if you're going to be doing an upgrade for your systems or you know, anything like that. It is nowadays with the advent of you know, really inexpensive servers or, like I said, we just turned XP into a, uh, a terminal server here. And it would cost us for you know, unlimited users, it would cost us 240 bucks. So I highly recommend you guys check this out, xpunlimited.nl. And right now, we are going to go ahead and kick it over to Shannon for trivia. Guess what? We're having another trivia giveaway. Yeah, I know. We've been kind of gone for a while on the whole trivia thing. CES happens, I'm sorry. But we're back, and we have an awesome giveaway this week. It's WYSIWYG's Volume 1 Freak by Ed Piscor. It's an awesome, awesome graphic novel, and it's kind of this documentary-style background history of freaking and hacking. So you've probably noticed letters here and there appearing now and then. If you go to hack5.org slash trivia and you put in those little letters here and there to form some kind of word, and enter that trivia question, and hopefully you'll get it right. If you answer in the first 24 hours from the, when this ep episode airs, you might get the chance to win this WYSIWYG comic book. And also, I do want to thank our sponsor, GoDaddy.com. Starting at less than $5 a month, web hosting from GoDaddy.com includes 99.9% .9 uptime, 24-7 support, and free access from GoDaddy Hosting Connection, the place to quickly install over 50 free applications like WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, Oscommerce, and more. If you want to make an impact online, GoDaddy has what you need. .com names as low as $1.99, plus world-class hosting, fast and easy website builders, and much more. Plus, if you enter code HACK1, that's H-A-K-1, you can get 10% off your entire order. So try it out, guys. I love GoDaddy, and so do the rest of the crew. And uh, yeah, I think the guys are going to finish it off now. All right, thanks, Shannon. Now, before we wrap up the show, we got a kind of a couple of things to get to. We actually had another web application security segment with our friend Mubix, but it turns out when you tether with your iPhone and the 3G and the Skype and that, well, anyway, we'll bring that to you guys when we can do it properly in studio. Yeah. Um, we do still have some emails I want to get to, but first, we have to thank another one of our fine sponsors who is bringing you the Technolust this week, HP. Yeah, I was uh, kind of interested and surprised when it popped into our email because I was like, oh, we use that. Yeah. Uh, the episode is brought to you by HP's Media Smart Server powered by Microsoft Windows Home Server. Uh, we have Home Server in our house and we use it primarily because we stream stuff off of our home server onto our 360, yeah. which is great for that. It's great if you guys have a, another media center in the house. Uh, one of the great, great things about it is easy backups of your Apple mm -hmm. 
and Windows machines. Yeah, they've got this nice little client app, and then it just does the rest. Well, for, for uh, Apple machines, it actually supports... R-Sync? No, it supports Time Machine. Ooh. So, yeah. Oh, so, that's, that's hot. Yeah, so Time Machine over the network on the HP Media Smart uh, server, uh, and it's automatic. See, it's easy. Get yourself a Windows server, and then switch all your other clients to, to you know, Mac, and Microsoft will be happy. <laughs> I'm sure that would work as well. Um, but um, it, it's, it automatically backs up and protects you guys. Uh, if you install the client or you're using you know, Time Machine, the media functions of it are absolutely amazing. And it's not an eyesore. Uh, it, unlike you know, so many of the other appliances that right. are out there, this thing actually looks like it could, it, it, it could sit. If you guys don't have a closet that you're going to throw it into or something like that. You might that. feel a little guilty about putting such a sweet piece of hardware inside your network closet along with the, uh, the ugly old switch. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, ours is tucked away in the thing, uh, in the closet. But anyway. So anyway, enjoy your digital media experiences. Check out the HP, um, what is it called? The Media, the Smart, media Smart Server the media powered Smart by Smart. Windows Home Server. There you go. I like that operating system. Definitely. Okay. So um, Bill wrote us from, I guess this is a follow-up from 419, I believe, to show us a really great Firefox extension that we can use for us SSH tunneling users. I've been doing a lot of that, especially when we went to CES. Yeah. Um, I, I usually go through some EVDO, but there were some airports with some really nice Wi-Fi. I can't believe we got that episode uploaded that quick. Though. Ten minutes. Ten minutes to upload an HD episode from the Las Vegas airport. The only thing redeeming about LAS was 20 megabits down. Yeah. We were getting literally 1.3 megabytes a second up over 40 consecutive streams or something. Yeah. It was ridiculous. We were just we were sucking the tubes down. All I know is it's kind of like a scavenger hunt. You actually have to find it. Right. Uh, if you're there, it's go to Terminal A22. You'll be all yes. set. So, or bring, or bring the uh, the Alpha. I'll have to show off the Alpha someday. The, yeah, they with need, the 500 milliwatt and the giant antenna. They need to have like like a range thingy. Like as you walk, it detects the range, and so you can like create like a net stumbler. Like no, create a map. They need a map. Okay, like, so like if you're NetStumbler, talk to my NetStumbler, and we both went this way, and then it figured it out? Yes. Huh? That would be amazing. Well, let's, 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 let's throw some things up into the forum, up into the ether. Maybe hit up the NetStumbler forums, because those kids are smart. Yeah. All right, so anyway, Bill writes us <laughs> to tell us this really nifty uh, extension for Firefox. It's, you can find it over here at Jeremy's Mozilla Extensions at mozmonkey.com, and it is the right down here at the bottom. Yeah, I've actually had a lot of people recommend this to me on my... Uh, on my blog after I post the how-to. Yeah, Switch Proxy is great. I'm actually using it right here, and you see I'll fire up, and I'll just do tunnel, and then it connects me, and, and I log in, and bam, and I'm running my local proxy, and I right-click down here, and I go to Switch Proxy, and Proxies, and choose my local SSH tunnel, and now, oh my god, I'm gonna blow your minds, I'm gonna go to IP, check in, and I'm not gonna blur it, because it's just the IP <laughs> address of, you know, Hack5, web server. Yeah. But anyway, now that I've blown your mind, it's really easy to manage a bunch of different proxy profiles yeah. without having to go into the tools and the settings and all that fun stuff. So thank you, Bill, for writing in about that. Yeah. I was also sent, and I can't remember which one of the cool Hack House kids was that sent me this, but uh, a little toy over at ThinkGeek that just deserved a little pimpage, not a sponsor or anything, but I think this is really neat. It's the Phantom Keystroke Logger, uh, I'm sorry, Keystro uh, not Logger, it's called the Keystroker version 2. What this guy does is a little USB uh, guy that you pop into to one of your coworkers' machines, right? Mm -hmm. And it emulates a USB mouse and keyboard. It yeah. doesn't take any drivers or anything like that. Windows just uses it as a regular device, right? Well, you can set, it's got a little jog dial on the side where you can set the interval that it will accidentally hit a keystroke or oh, do a God. little mouse movement at, so that you can like totally freak them out. This is like the next version of the Annoyatron, the little thing that beeps and you can't find yeah. it where it's beeping, right? We have one and I can't I, find it. I don't it. know where. We, we should have left it with the Rev3 kids, but oh wait, then again, the TSA would have found it and then that would have been not good. And Prager would have gotten another pat down. Mm. Um, so... <laughs> So that is the that Phantom Keystroker. And I, I should have a link here to the BSOD, B Sodomizer. It's a little device that Movix recently reviewed. Oh, I helped yeah. him do some video editing on it. Nifty little toy where it's USB, or not USB, it's a uh, VGA pass through that goes in between your VGA and your monitor and your, your computer here. Give anything a BSOD. Yeah, so he actually did a demo of an Ubuntu machine getting a BSOD. 
As far as your computers, no, everything's cool because it's just it's the yeah. analog hole. I love that stuff. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, that well. is our show for this week. Yeah, about that. We're gonna start feeling better here real soon. <laughs> yeah. I feel better, but it's like because you're sick, mm -hmm. it's like you make me, even though I'm not sick. A sympathy sickness. I yeah. like this. It's like get the fuck away from me already. Sorry. Here. All right, well we're done. Paul's Paul's telling us around. So anyway. Thank you guys for tuning us, uh, tuning us. <laughs> we like to be tuned, and next week we'll be here again, same time, same place. Take care, kids. No, I was, I was gonna. I totally and then I was like, roundhouse in his brain. Like, Alright. Did you see my notebook? I got like, oh yeah. You like that? No, no, but I got the revision three one there. Yeah. And split cast. Ubuntu, your favorite. Your favorite. I got more Ubuntu stickers. No. I should I'll put them on your forehead. I haven't wiped my ass with the one that's in my room that many times yet, so it's still good. <laughs>